I think further into that, st testing strategically create these halo effects for your company and it can be really impressive. So ideas become democratized and prioritized. So it's not anymore about who the idea is from and when that was proposed, but only ideas are compared one against another. And then we get to decide which we want to test first and second. And also everything is on the table and everything is testable. So those are great mental models that you'll find your company kind of adapts rapidly. Looking like a baddie, I show up and make them stop. Wanna know my name so badly, cause I run this whole block. Fit my hair, move my head, show the world I'm royalty. When I walk by, they be taking bows, cause they know I'm the queen, yeah. If I were to tell you right now that growth does not happen by accident, I think most of you would challenge me. And rightly so. Growth can sometimes be a product of your work. Or it can also be a byproduct. But are you able to tell which it is? Hey everyone, my name is Simon. I am a CRO manager over at Convergen Advocates. I am absolutely passionate about experimentation and specifically our topic today, which is strategic testing. You have my LinkedIn profile on this on the screen in front of you. So if you want to reach out after this presentation and share me your thoughts, your comments, feedback, I'd love to hear it. I also post every single day at 9.30 a.m. East and would love to have you over and share thoughts with you. So let's go back to this controversial statement that I just made. But this time, I'll say that consistent growth does not happen by accident. And I want you to think about that. Would you rather work on large initiatives and find out that sometimes some of them you achieved a big lift for a company, or would you rather work on smaller initiatives but unlock this steady stream of incremental gains? To answer that, let's go into our game plan today. And firstly, we'll define together what is testing strategically. Second, I'll teach you how to switch gears into strategic mode. And thirdly, I'll give you tools and real life examples and case studies to begin your own strategic optimization journey. All right. I want to ask first, what's the alternative to not testing? This, of course, is the status quo. Uh, companies right now are shipping stuff blindly that may or may not create actual growth. Performance is often measured after time. Uh, and we try to evaluate if it underperforms or overperforms after a certain period of time, and there's this lag that, that is created by this process. Ideas that are improved may be due to biases or maybe social dynamics and things like groupthink. It's also possible that team dynamics may cause some people to have a lot of voice, and individuals sometimes have a veto power. So let's dive into these alternatives. The first one is the status quo, meaning you ship large projects when they're ready and with extended timelines. And what you're seeing here is a gray curve that shows these types of projects in the course of which there can be multiple launches of projects that just do not pan out with anything successful. But at a certain point, one of these projects will, will possibly unlock a very large lift for the company. And then we go back into this process where uh, big projects are lined up one after the other, and eventually we find another big win. What we're seeing otherwise is that this gray uh, curve is being outpaced in its scale by the green one, which represents smaller incremental gains, but are more consistent. The issue here is that neither you or I can tell when we'll find the next lift in this process or how significant it will be and so while I've drafted this curve here like that, it's just one representation of hundreds of different possibilities here. The general idea is that if you have like big wins very rarely, then there are large periods of time where your growth is stagnant. Comparatively, if you get small gains, but very often, then at the very least, you're always on the up and up, and that can have a massive impact for the company. All right, then. But we're using this process and we did find a large lift for the company. Everyone is really excited. But then 
there are some important questions that we should try to answer. First one, did we measure it right? And if we're looking at a comparison in our data on two different time periods, that can be problematic. Maybe our traffic shifted. Maybe we have new traffic sources. Or possibly there's a seasonality in play, and we have 2x the traffic and 2x the sales, and so it makes comparison difficult. We're not looking at apples versus apples. Second question, are we sure that no external variable got in the way? That is important because these projects may have um, hundreds of variables. So then it's difficult to control all of them, but also we do not have certainty that other external uh, stimulus or variables may have come into play. So if we're not able to identify that, maybe we're missing out on some important info here. Third, a bit in the same vein, but are we sure we know what drove the increase? And typically with these large pro projects that I'm describing, the number of variables involved is very, very large. And so what that does is it can be very difficult to pin down which of these variables actually did have an impact. And maybe it's a very prominent variable in this entire project. Maybe not. But if you're not able to identify that, it feels like you're missing something. And the fourth question, which wraps this up, but also kind of puts everything into perspective, is are we able to identify and activate this winning variable so that we can double down on our success? Because if we won because of a very cool variable, but we are never able to find it and never able to reactivate it, then there's some uh, momentum and traction that is just lost in time and space. Let's explore alternative two right now. Tactical testing. So just to define it very simply, it's the act of conducting optimization with a focus on UX minor tweaks um, and best practices. And other examples are going to be pulling testing ideas from a blog, or looking in a swipe file and just choosing that, or maybe it can also be a, 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 you know copying the competitor. In all of these scenarios, the main issue is testing is just drawn from ideas uh, from the, 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 the dirtiest and cheapest source that we can find. There are four key symptoms of tactical optimization, and I want to quickly dive into them because it's important that we differentiate tactical from strategy here. So first, there's mostly flat test results in these, these optimization programs. And when you look at tests individually, what you'll find out is they seem like they should not have been prioritized. When you're looking at a group of tests, these multiple tests that are shipped, when you're looking at them at a high level, they seem scattered on the site. No prioritization exists in these programs, uh, and the different opportunities for optimization are not weighted once against another. Initiatives are also not grounded in any sort of supporting evidence, and all of that means we don't really know what we're solving for. Second issue is losing buy-in for CRO. And here, that will be caused oftentimes with a focus on immediate gains. The, this will cycle into short-term expectations from every stakeholder. And that in turn results into stress and pressure on the team members, on the optimization program, and generally creates this very heavy ambience. Top level leadership is going to be set in this mind that they're looking for quick ROI. And so your timelines become stretched. Um, and finally, that is all caused because optimizations do not feel impactful to them. And in reality, most of the time, they're not. Third symptom is a lack of strategic insights. Um, and here, test results, when they're mostly focused on numbers, that is already a big issue because we're, we're lacking uh, the, the learnings about our customers, about our business, and about our marketing. Tests are not trying to challenge the internal and business assumptions, which everyone has. It's important that we challenge them with tests and we try to verify and validate if we're right or not. Um, oftentimes, there's going to be no proper research and no proper strategy. Uh, and these optimizations are oftentimes not customer focused. So, of course, there are no strategic insights. If there was not an insight going into the test, it's going to be difficult to translate it, verify, and validate post-test. We need the support of the tests. 
in, in, in evidence, we need the research. Fourth symptom is ignoring the customer journey. And here, that's going to cause a lot of problem. First, uh, optimization may become a competitor to other channels. It's not a channel. You know, channels are additive. The more that you that you have budget into your channels, then it's going to result a, a pretty clear formula of ROI. With experimentation, when you unlock, you know, wins, you shouldn't see it as additive, but rather multiplicative, because a small gain that is created on the entire website and it's going to apply to all of your channels and all of your users. It can also become an issue that CR is perceived as a band-aid for poor performance caused elsewhere, and oftentimes that's going to be paved channels. But it cannot act in the short term, and so that just creates this kind of disconnect. Um, and finally, all of this leads the optimization program to miss key important touch points in the customer journey. And here I'm talking about the landing experience. It can also be the post-purchase experience, or you could consider exit intent as being just another small step that we forget to consider that are all important in the overall customer journey. What's the common theme here? Well, we're lacking qualitative feedback. The work does not return actionable insights, does not return actionable steps, and so that causes you to lose momentum and lose traction. The issue, if you're testing with only tactical uh, mindsets, is that you're, you have no guarantee that your campaigns can solve important problems for the customer. You want to achieve growth if you can't find and pinpoint these levers that go positively and also negatively. All right. So that leads me to tell you strategic testing is what unlocks this consistent growth. Um, shipping stuff blindly may or may not create this actual growth. But if you start optimizing with a strategic mindset, then you'll find out that this growth becomes a lot more consistent. And I'm even willing to go as far as to say it can become exponential. So looking at growth curves here, you'll find out is based on how sophisticated a CRO process is, the growth curve is very different. Now, what does sophisticated mean? And I'll just right off the bat come and say that it could also be translated with strategic testing here. So here's a quick summary of what that is. It means the inputs for our tests and all optimization comes from a research first approach. The more insights we have and the more that we stack, the more value we give to them. All ideas are prioritized and are compared one against another. And then we try to, to make sure that we optimize always against the, the highest impact possible ideas. It's irrelevant of who we come from, whether it be the design team, development. Uh, it could also come from a product team or even, you know, an executive. The person who proposes the idea is irrelevant. The idea itself is what is relevant. So we just compare that, uh, these ideas against each other, and we don't even know to know from who the idea comes from. It also means that when you're sophisticate, testing sophisticated with a sophisticated process, um, you are solving real issues for your customers. It also means that your testing is iterative. So once you've tested once against an hypothesis, you might test twice and thrice and more, whether the results were a win or loss or an inconclusive test. And so this is another important component. And all of that leads you to, over time, you gain a complete and holistic understanding of your customers due to these numerous touch points from the research and from the testing as well. Here, we're looking at a correlation with winning rates. And there's three tiers you can see. The first one is when you're testing only tactically, then you can aim to achieve about a 10 to 12% winning rate. Um, then when you level it up and you start implementing research and ad hoc data, you can already double that winning rate all the way up to using a holistic process. Strategic testing and sophisticated CRO can net you uh, up from 30% to 40% winning rate with your optimization program. This is to show you our high level of sophistication, how being strategic in your process creates a lot more wins. Now, hear me clearly here, more wins signify greater chances for you to meet ROI and exceed the target that you have. At this point in time, when you exceed ROI, 
then it unlocks more opportunities for your optimization program. You can start to explore, you can start to innovate because the risk perception is alleviated. More wins means a steeper exponential growth curve. And so that's also very appealing. But out of that, a high level of sophistication, it means being customer focused. So what are benefits for you to be customer focused in all of your initiatives for growing the company is that one, you capture more attention, you'll capture it faster and easier because you know exactly what your users respond positively to. You're going to increase their time on site and engagement rate because you know exactly what content takes to them. Increasing conversion rates is cool, but you also get to increase uh, business metrics like average order value and lifetime value. You'll also improve your customer satisfaction if you're on NPS surveys, and you'll find out that people just feel more uh, aligned to your brand. And finally, it can also improve your marketplace reputation simply by the fact that you're aligned to your customers. Moving further into that, st testing strategically create these halo effects for your company, and it can be really impressive. So ideas become democratized and prioritized. So it's not anymore about who the idea is from and when that was proposed, but only ideas are compared one against another. And then we get to decide which we want to test first and second. And also, everything is on the table and everything is testable. So those are great mental models that you'll find your company kind of adapts rapidly. This is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. Every week we share interviews with and conference sessions by our favorite conversion rate optimizers from around the world. So if you like this video, smash that like button and consider subscribing. It helps us a bunch. Now back to the episode. You continue to learn about your customers and that's valuable because not only you get your time of pulse about their trends, but you're able to quickly catch when uh, they, they dislike something that, you, that you've proposed or tested. Um, and that allows you to be really, really well aligned to how they respond to everything you ship. You'll discover unique user segments that you otherwise would never have found out. These segments can perform in ways you've never expected. And it can also be segments that you never even thought existed. Um, all this leads you to discover these levers for growth. Some of them you're going to want to activate because they go in a positive direction and others you're just going to want to rail down and deactivate because they're, they're negative for the company. Finally, every initiative is measurable and is measured. And so it's easy to tell directions that produce valuable ROI for the company and directions that we thought would, but do not. All in all, as a company, we start to realize that we think we know our users and our customers, but that still we get it wrong more than 50% of the time. Even with research, even with a thoughtful process with optimization, we realize that we have no idea before we did optimization what the real success rate that we had was. And at this point, maybe we never want to go back. So how can you test strategically first? Consider that all components of your CRO process are equal. You need this whole process in place to capture the maximum value from CRO. And it's important that you keep in mind that the most boring inputs are what create the exciting outputs. And by that, I mean the process, the workflows, the research, and the documentation. Collect your primary and market, uh, customer and market research insights and gain a 360 degree understanding of your customers. You keep your thumb on pulse and you get fresh up insights often that allows you to stay really closely connected to your customer, follow the trends that they are, 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 are telling you via their behavior. And um, you can only solve these real issues for customers if you actually have that knowledge. Isolate country roadblocks with research and iterative testing. So with research, you're able to find out these roadblocks, but over time, through testing and through additional research, you'll refine your definition for some of these roadblocks and you'll post progress. And sometimes you may even consider that one of these roadblocks is fully solved or that you've made, I don't know, 40% pro uh, progress against it. So this entire process of testing strategically allows you to be very in tune with what works best and works for your customers on the website. Finally, create and manage rigorous documentation. That assures accountability for review, your team and everyone 
Um, and it's just a step that is needed. It is boring. But in six months, it's going to be helpful for you to circle back to previous tests and understand what, are, what were the insights going into the tests and what were the insights out of it so that you can leverage that in your new test that you're working on right now. Putting all of this together, strategy CR comes from a customer-centric approach. Um, and so let's start putting customer uh, at the front and center of your operations and your project with primary research. There are a large number of research methods that you can conduct. Here, what I want you to see is that most of them are complementary. You don't need to run all of them. That's not what I'm saying here. And on the other end, what you can do is try to match these different methods to have some user behavior to observe what they do and to also get some qualitative feedback about why and how and all these other uh, qualitative as aspects. And so you try to create this, uh, if you want this portfolio of research methods, that's gonna help you gain this complete understanding of customers. And now I know this can seem overwhelming and that's not at all my intent. So let's talk about a research roadmap so that it is not overwhelming. First, your goal is to simplify. You should conduct maybe one method every two weeks, maybe one method every month, depending on your bandwidth and availability. Try to you know spend no more than a few hours, a couple of hours per method. Document around 15 to 20 hypotheses per method. So that is a really manageable number. Uh, you're able to achieve that. I am fully confident of that. And uh, it makes it so that uh, you can circle back later on. 10 to 15 hypotheses, if you multiply that by four research methods, you're already near a Haiti total hypotheses. It's going to take a long time for you to test all of that. And so what it does, it creates this large backlog that you can easily refer to and stop searching for ideas and instead, you just have these data-driven recommendations that you can run. And if you've already prioritized them, then it's a, a one step less in your work before choosing what you should test next. Finally, refresh insights at least once a year. I'll say that's that's the max that I would I would recommend. I suggest you look at a at a shorter time frame because trends come rapidly, people evolve quickly, and you never know how, how fast your market can shift. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend maybe once every six months, but I very least try to do it once a year. And don't forget, it's an iterative process. You can rerun the same research method. You can choose to rerun it for a specific segment of content that you're looking for. Uh, you can rerun it for a specific user segment that you're interested in diving into. And you can also just consider that redoing the same research method with no extra parameters will yield 15 to 20 different hypotheses than when you had the first time. So let's explore three different research methods together. First, we're going to be looking at a user path and follow analysis in analytics. Second, using Hotjar, we're going to look at an exonet and poll. And thirdly, we're going to do a value proposition creation study here. Choosing these three methods creates a very nice portfolio for you to see how these very different methods can uh, give you this, this broad understanding of your customers and user base. So for user path and follow analysis, we're going to be looking at an e-commerce gifting flowers website. For them, there's parity in their vertical, and customers are skept have a high level of skepticism. Reason for that is you're buying a flower arrangement, and you're sending it to a different person than yourself. So what you're seeing on a website is a very well arranged uh, picture of the product, but you have concerns that it might not be shipped, might not be delivered at the front door of your gift recipient, exactly the same as what you see on the site. So first, before we dive into the insights here, this is how I would explain uh, for you how to run the methodology of this, this research method while I am not a data scientist. So boiling it down to just four easy steps. First, understand the traffic sources. So that means realizing what are the main channels, uh, what percentages of users come from them, and maybe understanding a couple of campaigns can be helpful. Then. Go into basic reports like device types, channels, campaign. You know all of these basic reports one by one with no extra parameter. Just try to find gaps in what you see. Finally, use um, user flows and landing page reports to find these follow points. Connect the dots between all of what you found and all of the notes that you made and try to formulate hypotheses to solve what you think causes the follow points for this website. 
we first looked into the, the, the device types report and found out that mobile is a bit more than half of the total audience on this website. Then we looked at e-commerce conversion rate to find out that they convert twice as worse as desktop devices. So we do find here uh, an untapped potential in this segment for uh, out of mobile users on this website. We looked at the fallout uh, points in the homepage funnel. So that means users that landed on the homepage, uh, out of all of them, only 28% would eventually land on the product page. So what that tells us is that for, for the most part, three quarter of the audience never gets to shop on this website. So we can clearly see that there's a huge gap because we could get a lot more people on the product page. Well, if we want to keep the same conversion rate out of cart, then that would most likely mean a lot more transactions on this website, right? We went one step further and cross-referenced with heat map and scroll map data. So on your left here, you can see the scroll map that reveals that a very, very high drop-off rate just below the fold on this page. And what that tells us is more than half of the audience on mobile doesn't really scroll on the homepage. Then when you're looking at the maps, there's three core uh, areas and uh, that are being tapped. And what you find out is the hamburger menu is one, and the two other that are CTAs that our users shop are getting very, very low engagement rate. So that helps us connect the dots here. We have an untapped potential with mobile devices converting at lower rates. We found that a lot of sessions landing on the homepage uh, never get to a product page. And then we're looking at a heat map here that tells us most people on either click the menu or nothing at all. So here's how we designed an experiment to solve for that. We looked at the section right below the fold on the on the homepage and thought that maybe showing a single product was what it, what caused the issue. And so we replaced it with a a side-by-side two-by-two -side, uh, two products here, allowing users to have a better understanding that there's a large product catalog. You can see how this by itself, just by listening to this feedback that our users gave us, generated a 10% lift in transaction for this website. Nothing to scoff at. Then looking at an excellent temple that we ran with Hotjar, this was for a lead gen outdoor kitchen seller. And specifically for them, the issue is they sell their products in two different uh, routes for their customers. The first one, uh, you can buy the product as an e-commerce ticket, just going to the website from a category page to the product page and adding the cart. Um, the other option is if you want to customize a product, you can go into a 3D uh, design tool that allows you to build the product step-by-step -step, meaning you add the, the, the grill yourself, the countertops, you can add a sink, uh, you can even uh, choose cabinetry. All of these uh, the steps are managed by yourself in this 3D tool. And when that is done, then you're led into a lead generation flow. So you're not converting, you're not buying on site directly, but you are converting through this lead generation form. Just before we dive in, how you should run an exit and end poll uh, is boiled down in basically these, these six steps. So first, tag Hajar or whichever tool you choose to use on your website and set up the poll to trigger on exit intent. Use this exact question format. Uh, and it's important you, 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 you do not mess with the wording. We've tested that and it's the most, the best performing copy for, for the question. What, if anything, prevented you from converting today? It's an open-ended question and you should not go with a multiple choice. Uh, we want a simple free fill text field and we want to let users tell us in their own words exactly what prevented them. Target pages that are specific to conversion and ideally desktop only. We're trying to collect a minimum sample of 100 responses, then you should only change your targeting parameters if you're not able to capture enough traffic and enough responses. Categorize all of their responses, all of the issues they report in a spreadsheet and create a graph with percentages. Here, you want to create categories that are like pricing, timeline, product questions, shipping and returns. Um, and you know we have found that usually there, there is universally about three to seven reasons for people to, to abandon your site. Uh, these are either questions or objections. And so pull the voice of customer samples, the exact response that you found out, and drop them in a slide to share with others. Reading the responses is what's going to have the most value, not the percentages. Let me wrap this up. This isn't a quantitative research method. It is qualitative. The focus is on the voice of the customer. 
and what you want is capture their authentic feedback. Once all of that is done, present that to your team and together ideate five, 10 hypotheses to try to solve these objections for your customers. Here for this client, you can see our graph. Um, what matters the most is not the numbers. We don't care that much about the percentages other than they give us a sense of the, the, the relative importance between the different issues. The most important stage is next, looking at the individual responses to capture the voice of the customer. Here, I would usually create a single slide for each category, but for, for the purposes of being concise, I've regrouped multiple categories on this single slide. You can see how I copy-pasted the responses from users without any alteration. Here, what we want to do is understand what are their questions, what are their objections, and um, how can we solve against it? We went one step further. Looking at their responses, we found out that there's two different stages of the customer journey that were that, that were related to these questions and objections. Firstly, there were product options that regrouped appliances, size and shape, and finish and style. For all three of these broader categories, what was happening is the user is still at the stage of choosing their product, and they're still trying to find if something fits their perfect needs and desires. And they're very early on in their buying journey. Comparatively, we found in green the buying process, regrouping assembly pricing and delivery time. Here, for most users, we realized that they had already chosen a, a product they wanted to buy, but their objection or, or question was about the buying process. And so they're later in their customer journey and their, their, their concerns are entirely different. That was tremendously important in understanding how we can design a website that helps users self-select into which of the two options they can buy their product, whether going the e-commerce route or the 3D custom building route. So our test here um, led us to realize that the second section on the homepage for this website was misleading users into understanding the two buying options. Firstly, there wasn't a price difference between custom or e-commerce. It's only a matter of if you want to build out the product to be personalized to you or not. Secondly, the images were, were indicating to users that the custom was a bigger product and more complete, which isn't the case either. We're just a, a choice of, of picture selection. And finally, it might be a bit small for your eyes, but the bullet points that were describing products were not really helpful and were very similar. So we rebuilt the module targeted around the buying process to guide users into towards either buying via e-commerce or buying via the 3D tool if they wanted to customize and personalize their product. This generated an 18.6% uplift in leads uh, without affecting any of the e-commerce per performance. And so you can see how we reassured people and drove them to convert rather than just hesitate and stay on page. Lastly, value proposition development is one of the fuzzy research methods and a lot of people are, are not sure how to uh, approach that and what are the steps. So, we're going to be looking at a SaaS edtech client that's in the real estate investing industry, and they're mostly providing content to their users. Um, just before we go into the insights, I want to give you my process here. And it starts by identifying direct and substitute competitors. And here I encourage you to ask your teammates, your clients, whoever you're working with, gather a group of people and try to get a holistic list of all the competitors. It can be direct, it can be substitute, it can even be, you know, like very far reaching. Go for all of them. Added their main site pages, paid landing pages, and also ads. Just try to look for copy, market positioning, competitive advantages, narratives. You can even go as far as looking at their visual tone of the, the imagery they use. Then leverage the internal research that you already have and the voice of customer samples. And with all of that, group it together. And basically what you're trying to do is identify what happens in the market and what is something different that we can do that we think would resonate with our users to create this net new value proposition and you create as many variations as you can. And then you, you, you think they may appeal to your customers. So the next step is to test it. With this client, we found common themes in their competitor. And you can find in the text itself, there's a lot of content that's very similar. You can even look at the, the general uh, visual of these websites that are all very neutral in their color tones you'll find out that even the calls to actions, the buttons are all look fairly similar. Um, 
And so we have four core takeaways looking at, at all this uh, sea of competition here. First one is there was parity in the market between all the direct competitors, not even go as far as say all the substitute and kind of farther reaching competitors. Second, there's vertical wide focus on jargon and on technical terms. So instead of making it easy for the customers, businesses are using these complex uh, terms and a language that is very uh, heavy to read that might not resonate with customers. Thirdly, we found that messaging was features focused rather than being customer focused. So we were just talking about like coming from a corporate tone and describing what users can do rather than describing what they can achieve and kind of speak to what they, the, the problem is they're trying to solve. Finally, messaging across all competitors is task focused rather than outcome focused. Here, that was really important because what we found out is when you're investing and, and, and actually when you're searching about investing in real estate, the, the reality is that most of these users are probably in an in a investing mindset, which is more important than the act of the investment itself. Meaning what they're trying to do is not just put their money aside, but rather there's an objective, uh, objective in their mind. And it's probably achieving their financial freedom or you know, um, removing stress from their lives. And so we leverage that very intensely. In this test, you can see the sign-up page for our client where this is a, a free account where you can browse content and gather information about real estate investing. And so we change the value proposition with a more aspirational uh, direction with unlock and potential being two keywords here. What we wanted to do is stay away from the task of investing itself and speak to customers' goal of possibly going into the route of investing with real estate. And so you can see all this test just by focusing on what exists in the market and creating something different. We've generated a 40.49 lift in signups. So listening to customer feedback, finding what they care about and speaking to it can have real and significant impacts for your company. So do you see how strategic testing can change how you think about your business, your marketing and your customers? Well, I want you to dominate your market with consistent growth, with strategic testing. And so here's four more uh, key points for you to, to remember. Is one, being customer focused itself is a point of differentiation. Second, it can also be a competitive advantage for you if your industry is in parity or perceived as a commodity. The simple fact that you optimize and you gain these recurring small incremental gains is gonna be a competitive advantage against your competitor who's not doing it. Third, for most companies, they're going to perceive optimization as extra work. And most direct competitors are either not going to do it or they do not know how. And so you gain this advantage in front of them. And finally, remember that you can iteratively test into this approach, just like with everything else. Uh, but you're going to drive measurable impact. And that's going to be way better than guessing or taking an approach of closing your eyes and hoping that it lands right. Before we, we part ways, here's three simple, actionable research methods that I want you to set up. And my hope is that you're going to start setting them up right now as we're talking. So you're going to use only two tools, one of which you already own, and another which is crucial for, for your user insights, Hotjar. Set up an exit intent poll. Just try to collect a sample of 100 voice of customer uh, data code them between three to five different objections and try to craft at least five to 10 hypotheses. Then with the same tool, Hotjar, go into your heat maps and scroll maps, and I'm gonna make it simple for you, but you can go into way more details. Just try to look for items that people look for and engage with and items that they don't, um, and then try to craft 10, 20, 30 hypotheses around that uh, so that we try to solve and drive and direct users on our site to where it makes most sense. Finally, into whichever analytics tool you're using, go into your basic reports and try to find user path and follow points. So just looking at uh, initial gaps that you can find and then finding where in the journey that happens. Uh, and then you're able to craft a couple more hypotheses just based on that. And that brings this presentation to a close. I hope you found it uh, interesting, valuable, insightful. And please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn if you're interested. I would love to discuss and engage with you 
Uh, and with that, have a great day. This is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. Every week we share interviews with and conference sessions by our favorite conversion rate optimizers from around the world. So if you like this video, smash that like button and consider subscribing.